Welcome to ISRA Leaks Grand Touring Championship, brought to you by the Z1 Simwheel LCD Display. You can see the LCD display uh, can show the dashboards of uh, the cars in our racing, in addition to some uh, good timing and scoring information. It makes a great addition to any sim rig. More information is available at z1simwheel.com. This race here is Season 7, Race 5. The Crimson Tide 70. And uh, as we jump into the point standings, these are uh, actually need to be updated because we've got two drop weeks factored in when there should only be one. But I think it's pretty accurate to say that Colin McLean is leading the Daytona prototypes, although with uh, more than 48 points. Chuck Chambliss down in second, and Brian Carey in third. And uh, Chris Damron Jr., uh, once again, he'll have 75 points uh, right there, but uh, Mike Kelly actually not a factor anymore as the, starting this race he moves to the Daytona prototype, so really we need to look at uh, James Mines and Marty Jeffries. And finally, Wyatt Foster uh, with 50 points. That actually might be uh, accurate due to a races he's mixed with uh, Ricardo Machuca, James Cohen, and Mark Payne all really close. Uh, that's uh, all vying for the first spot, uh, so we'll have to see how that plays out. Brian, show us the map. All right, well, Barber Motorsports Park is actually a relatively new track. Uh, it opened up in 2003. It's a 15-turn, 2.38-mile, 3.83-kilometer course. Um, it's been run uh, in the IndyCar Series recently, a track record of uh, 1 minute 10 seconds, basically, by Will Power. But as you can see, there is a ton of corners. It's twisting, it's turning. There's a little bit of elevation change, but um, this is going to be a tough, uh, tough, tough race because um, there is a lot packed in those 2.38 miles. Multi-class racing going to be extremely difficult. Turn 7, 7A, and 7B are another blind series of corners, much like 3 at Road Atlanta. So a lot of action, but a lot of frustration for the drivers, too. Okay, well, let's look at uh, qualifying. We've got Kevin Swat taking pull at a 116. Nine three, Carlos Passos with a one seventeen four for eight nine uh, four nine eight. That's a pretty big gap. Uh, then Russell Cow, Colin McLean, Timothy Stoll, Daniel Gralty, Brian Carey, Mike Kelly, John Cousland, and uh, missed the tenth. And then in the four GT, Daniel Burns takes pole position with a twenty one point seven one. Chris Dameron Jr. a twenty one point seven eight. That's row one. Row two is Edward Van Velsen. Uh, Matthew Voigt, row two. Math, Marty Jeffries, Kenny Colligan, row three. Patrick Spence, Tim McLeish, row four. And then Lance Snedder and Jeff Smith, row five. Ricardo Machupa takes a pole with a 22.7. James Cullen was a ways behind with a 123.1. Don Hunter and Jamie Burris are row two. Lauren Bateman and Sean Cuthbertson are row three. Julio Palacio, Ryan Huff are row four. And Jules Moret and Brent Bryles are row five. Well, uh, let's see. So, uh, this is going to be a pretty tough track. Barber is a uh, pretty narrow all around. It's got lots of twists and turns, and um, a whole lot of opportunity for multi class passing. So, uh, definitely a real challenge here, I'd say. Um, it's also a pretty slippery track. There are a couple places that are fairly off camber. Uh, for example, uh, turn two there, um, which we're not looking at the moment, but uh, we will see uh, pretty soon. Actually, this might be turn two that the static camera is checking out. Um, It's going to be hard for these cars to get formed up going to the line because the corners are up and down pretty tight. So uh, we're going to pretty see a pretty uh, spread out start here as we are about to go green. Yeah, you can see even uh, just getting on to the uh, main front straight, you've got a, a right-hander and then a, a left-hander, and uh, they're both pretty tight. But uh, fortunately, the start finish is pretty far up down the, uh, up the straight. So here we go. Now we're going green. Well, Colin McLean shot the gap there at the start and went right up to second place. Uh, uh, slightly slower qualifying than he was expecting, but he made up for it in about two corners, so <laughs> McLean up to second. I'm noticing too on some of these cars here, something we didn't really notice at Road Atlanta, but they are really leaning into the corners here. You can really see the, uh, as you come loading up into this, uh, 
right, left, right here, which as you can see is completely blind. In real life, unfortunately, racing doesn't have in real life, you'd have a, uh, a cone or a bollard on the apex of one of those corners there, so you can kind of spot where you're turning into as you're coming down the hill. Um, but uh, here you just kind of have to feel it out and remember where it is. Uh, Carlos Passos is right over the all over the back of Colin McLean there. This is a battle for second place. Coming to with a slight lead at this point. And you can see from the onboard here, there is not a lot of time to rest. That front straightaway is not very straight. This coming up here is probably the longest straightaway, even though it's curved heavily. Oops, someone did a little loop-de-loop -loop there, and uh, hopefully was able to keep going. Looks like that was uh, Chuck Chambliss. Yeah, that's his car right in front. Oh, and Anthony Muna is making a uh, smart pass on the inside of John Kelly there to take uh, 11th place from him. Rempereau, Gilles Moret, Brent be able to make the move stick on the inside. Gilles tried to take him wide, but can't get it done. Um, so Brent's got the place. The repeat of the pass we just saw, just in a different class. Yeah, that turn there, it's probably going to see a lot of the uh, passing in any class, either inter-class or, uh, you know, in-class passing. A nice shot of a fire truck there on the southern track, in case one was <laughs> bursting into flames. You know, we're well protected. So, whereas Road Atlanta, well, had some twisty bits and whatnot, had a lot of areas where you could, you know, at least that one straight where you could rest. There is no rest here, as we're showing Russell yeah. Cow in the... Uh, now in the 36 car. Yeah, even even the straights that you have, as small as they are, is, but once you catch up to, if you're in a faster class, or, well, I guess if you're in any class, once you, um, once the classes mix up on the straights, you're planning, okay, am I going to be able to pass this car coming up to this turn? Will I get him on the straight? So even... Even though your arms might be resting a little bit while you're going on the straight, your brain is still, you know, it's thinking a mile a minute trying to figure out when can I pass this guy? When is this going to be safe? Will I be able to get by? So this, you're going to have to be, you know, 110% focused for the entire, the entirety of this race to be able to perform well. And we are looking at uh, Chris Dameron Jr. in a rare position of not being in the lead. So he is uh, chasing Edward Van Velsen. I believe who was in a movie played by Viggo Mortensen, but uh, <laughs> looks like uh, one of our newcomers here is uh, leading the race, uh, and Amron Jr. is trying hard to uh, keep up with him. It's good we have some competition for Damron. Uh, Timothy Stoll coming up on uh, what looked like Dan Gralty there for um, a certain position, which I believe is fifth. You would be correct. Chris Damron Jr. sticking his nose in there, but not being able to get it done. Uh, ben Velson's able to hold him off. And just behind them, you can see the uh, Cadillac leader, Ricardo Machuca, had a great performance the last time at uh, Road Atlanta. And in these early opening laps, <laughs> he's able to keep up fairly well with these uh, four GTs. Yeah, it's one of those phenomena we touched on briefly in other races, but uh, the uh, Cadillacs actually had, oh no, Vin Velsen has run wide, and Damron Jr. back to his original rightful position, if you will, <laughs> back to the four GTs. Uh, but like I was saying, the uh, in qualifying trim, the Cadillacs and the four GTs are actually very, very close, and the fastest Cadillac drivers um, typically mixing it up, even in the top five of the four GTs. However, during the race, typically those classes will, uh, the four GT has the legs over the Cadillac on a race run, and those will spread out, but these first few laps tend to be a little tight. 
And it's all uh, Carlos Paso is able to. Uh, this is he's got a few laps into the race, which unfortunately he hasn't been able to do recently. He's had some uh, pretty bad luck with uh, early lap incidents. Able to uh, run, uh, continue up front and running down Colin McLean for second place. And this is uh, John Kelly, and they are in the. Uh I believe that it was corner, uh, corner eight chicane. Looked like Chuck Chandler had run a little wide, and uh, Kelly able to take advantage and pull up another spot. Yeah, well, Carlos is giving Colin a hurry up here. Russell Cow is behind uh, Carlos, giving him a hurry up. So uh, these guys are pushing each other hard with uh, Kevin Swa, though, uh, extending that lead into a modest but significant two seconds. See the uh, the battling between Colin McLean and Carlos Passos, uh, really allowing Russell Cow to catch up right into the back of Passos as they came across the line uh, last lap. There was still a bit of a gap between Passos and Cow, and now that gap has disappeared. And now we're on board with Fabio Loyola. To honestly, I don't know who that is. That's the first race I've seen him run with us. So. Um, a lot of guys, when you're new to this series, they'll jump into the Cadillac as the first guy to do, and uh, Fabio currently running at 11, uh, chasing down uh, Gilles Moret in the uh, 31 SRN car up ahead. And it looks like uh, actually Fabio is taking that 10th place away from Jill. He's up to 10th and he's uh, moving forward quickly. So uh, let's see what uh, one of our newcomers, uh, at least in the GTC series anyway, can do. And here's Chuck Chambliss uh, trying to regain the spots that he lost early in the race by going to the inside of John Kelly. And I don't think John will fit him too much. Nope, takes the position. So Chuck Chambliss is, uh, I believe, up to 11th place. I believe that's what this is. Yep. Another good view of just how tough that corner is for those these guys to navigate through. Uh, you can see the suspension travel on uh, <coughs> Chuck Chambliss' car even from this chopper view as he uh, went over those curbs. Yeah, it's really weird that because the road in Atlanta was such a bumpy track where this one is billiard table smooth and uh, for some reason, at least maybe just perception of me, but it seems like you can really see the suspension travel on this track. McLean still being pressured by Carlos Passos. They're starting to catch up to uh, a little bit of traffic now. That's going to... Ooh, and Carlos really pushing to make a pass. That's uh, Stephen Clark and the Can-Am Racing Cor uh, Cadillac really making a very bold move. I'm not sure if that was um, definitely not a move I would make. I would have waited a little bit. But they, those guys made it work good heads up driving by Clark to realize that he was going to come through there. It looks like we got Daniel Vernes here. He does, I believe, was he on pole position? Has a little bit of a bent rear wing, so uh, unfortunate for Daniel. He had that uh, big crash at uh, Road Atlanta last week, and uh, was uh, he's got the speed, that's for sure. But he's currently it looks like he's running in third place still. So bent wing aside, it looks like he's going to take that position for Matthew Boyd. Yeah, Matthew Boyd just giving it to him. I'm not sure if um, 
He did that because he knew it was faster, but you can see Voight put on the uh, brakes a little bit as they were on the straightaway just to allow him to get enough speed. Oh, and just seeing Kevin Sawa there coming up, uh, clearly faster than these cars, but just nowhere for him to go. Uh, uh, no one doing anything wrong there at all, just, you know, two into one doesn't go sometimes, so he just had to be patient and wait his turn. On board with Anthony Muniz now, as he, oh, that's not, that's, there's a car out there, I don't know where. <laughs> Apparently that's the uh, new section of the track they just put in, there's a couple of cars there testing it out. Just an interesting position, just a lot of random stuff happening right there, and unfortunately <laughs> Anthony's dropped back behind John Kelly, so back to 12th position. I was thinking of the Nintendo prototypes too, the braking zone for that corner, and I forget what corner the uh, actual name is, I'll just check that in a second, but anyways, the one main passing area is because it drops downhill just as you're getting to the braking zone, so it's very, very easy to lock one of the brakes, and these Daytona prototypes lose a lot of speed with, uh, I mean, sorry, they lose a lot of speed, they don't, they don't not lose, they can't brake, what I'm trying to say, <laughs> it's interesting, a lot of negatives in there, they can't brake, so they don't slow down, so you get over the crest, you hit the brakes right, you'll slow down right away, you'll get to the apex, you don't, you lock a front brake, and you'll do exactly what Anthony did there and run wide. And Colin has jumped right onto the tail of Kevin Savoy to the inside of him for the lead. Now, uh, Kevin had a pretty hefty lead, but once he got into traffic, Colin has closed right up on him. And this is Russell Kyle closing right on the back of Carlos Passos. And he's going to pull right up on the long side, but there's not really any room for him to make a, a pass on him. But there's still traffic ahead, and with Looks like uh, Russell Kyle's been so far able to negotiate through traffic a little bit quicker than Carlos has been. Yeah, like going on the outside there, unless uh, you know you're Ryan Hunter way, you're not going to uh, get through going into that corner. So, <laughs> actually, come to think of it, I think he just ran into someone there too. But that's beside the point. Is Daniel Gralty uh, in an uncharacteristic ninth behind John Kuzlin in an uncharacteristic eighth in this car? So. Uh, Barber Motorsports Park is definitely not Lorenzo Gil Moret is off the track luckily he hasn't hit anything hopefully he didn't hit anything to send him into that position so Jill should continue with just a little bit of pride and time lost Another one of those drivers, you have Timothy Stahl here, which is nice to see his car not in a tire barrier. <laughs> um, both him and Carlos have had some wretched luck in the first few races here, but... Uh, oh, and he, is that uh, Russell Cow? It is Russell Cow. Yeah. He just took a position from... Timothy Stahl literally flying in from nowhere. Uh, Russell Cow looks like he's dropped back from Carlos. I don't know if he had an incident or ran off, but uh, Timothy Stahl able to take advantage of that. Hopefully, now that I've said that, he doesn't go throw it into the tires. It looks like he's going pretty good and ready to move forward. And good on board Justice you and seeing the uh, leader go past there. Into the wall. Hopefully not over the fence. I think that might have been Don Hunter. No, no. Yeah, it was. Don Hunter is dropping down the, the uh, standings right now. And yeah, there, there we is. have it, a chopper view of him getting back on track. And he's going to try to get that wheel that thing back to the pits, but... Uh, Judging by the pace he's going right now, I don't know how successful he'll be in getting that thing repaired. It's also a very tricky pit entrance too because the corner is blind, right hand or down, you know, up and downhill. And you kind of have to, the pit entrance is kind of midway through the corner on the outside. So you really got to, you know, spot that as soon as you can with Jeremy Burris with what looks like a, oh no, Dan Grolty right at the back of John Cook. Not quite sure what he was doing there. He'd, uh, it was all uh, gas and uh, not a lot there, but it looks like they got out of it all right. We'll see if there's any damage to the front of Gralty with Brent Bryles now spinning, and uh, I can't talk fast enough to keep up with the action as Brent spins across the track. I'm back with uh, Jeremy Burris there with his uh, cleverly contoured rear wing. They do that specifically for this track, special no. secret aerodynamics. 
I think I just saw him go flying past James Cullen. James Cullen looks slow. Mike Kelly with a very, 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 very white looking car. <laughs> As he just, uh, like I mentioned before, he had just switched teams and unfortunately not able to uh, get that painted. So he's running without sponsorship for this race. Hopefully by the, uh, the next round, he'll have that thing painted up nicely. And there we are with James Cullen, who, yes, I said he'd, uh, he'd drop back and was slow. I don't see any obvious damage, but uh, we'll see what happens in this pit stop. He wouldn't be pitting otherwise, I don't think, at this point. And hopefully I got Dan Gralty on the end of uh, John Kuzlin here, trying to even out the other side of his, uh, his rear bumper there. <laughs> When another car has uh, got it wrong going through that corner, you can see the uh, tire marks. And oh, it's Timothy Stoll, the commentator curse. Oh, I'm sorry, buddy. I honestly don't. You know, <laughs> that's that's unfortunate. That that car is banged up. And well, to be fair, just let Jesse by the angle. I don't think he threw into the tires. No, like probably the. That, that, that was uh, all Armco. Yes. Yeah, sorry, Tim. That was that was a hundred percent my fault. I know you're driving the car and you know how to control the steering and the gas and the brakes or whatever, but <laughs> pretty sure I had more to do with that than you did. <laughs> uh, Dan Gralty really trying to hustle to get around John Kuzland here. Excellent berm of earth there. <laughs> Looks like he's uh, he has the uh, pace on him in the first one, and that looks like that is Ryan Huff in the SRN Racing Cadillac off as they head down towards uh, to turn five. I'm not sure if there's any damage because he's off again. Yeah, you know what? I just I'm noticing this the last race in this race here that the only time we get to see Ryan Huff is when he's driving on the grass. So uh, hopefully when he's getting people to watch this race, he's like, hey, check out what I'm doing here, and uh, <laughs> it's not. I assure you, I see him race. He does not just drive in the grass. He is a very quick and capable driver, but occasionally, and the director seems to want to pick on him whenever he's on the grass. Looks like we're going to take a look at cha a chapter view of a battle evolving between Brian Carey and Mike Kelly. This is for fifth position. That is, uh, I'm not sure if there's more damage in the car than I remember or not. That looks, uh, maybe it's the same. No, you get used to it after a little while, and then you come back to the car, and you're like, oh, yeah, nope, that's terrible. <laughs> mm. So it was, uh, fairly chaotic there for a while, and things seem to have settled down a little bit more now. Uh, there's oh, Anthony Muniz who's got what appears to be severe rear end damage, so uh, that off there, normally those exhausts aren't exposed like they are right now. Yeah. Yes, I I, uh, I can confirm that there was a, uh, a rear ending that uh, occurred. Oh yeah, at least uh, you kept the wing looking good though. Uh, gotta keep the sponsors looking good there. <laughs> gotta keep them happy. Otherwise, he's got. Otherwise, I'm not paying to fix that. I don't have the cash to pay to fix that. Yeah, let's give a little shout out to the sponsors, Libro Financial Group, for those two cars there that have graciously not yet given us money, but uh, hopefully get them to watch <laughs> some of these events and you know say, hey, this is a it's good exposure for uh, these guys and uh, maybe uh, throw a. Maybe throw new some equipment to, to the team's way, but uh, back to the race battle here. And it looks like uh, Kelly's been able to make up a bit of time over here uh, against Kerry for fifth place. Uh, it's about a half a second separating these two guys so far. 
Oh, and that is Stephen Clark off. Cannot tell which corner that is. Looks like he's able to continue. Doesn't look like he took any damage, just spun off the track. Yeah, I think I was towards the end of the lap there, like, uh, turn 12, or 13 and 14. Yeah, that looks about right. Actually, that'll be one thing I'm looking forward to as a commentator, back to a track that has a, uh, more cleverly named corners. It's a little bit easier than thinking of one, two, three. Russell Cow still working on Carlos Passos there. It looks like, uh, at least in the Daytona prototypes, everyone's kind of split off into pairs almost. You've got Kevin Savoy currently leading, Kelly McLean two seconds back. Then it's Carlos Passos and Russell Cow separated by half a second. Then this battle we're watching right now on screen, Brian Carey, Owen. Mike Kelly thought about thought he might be able to get alongside him going on to that straight, but he's not going to quite have the speed. Um, but anyway, yeah, these guys are bumper to bumper. And then you have John Kuzlin and Daniel Gralti just separated by about a half second. Actually, this being Mike Kelly's first race back at the Daytona Prototypes. He ran the LMP class last year, and I remember a lot of those battles uh, with uh, Mike back in the uh, the uh, Le Mans prototype uh, that we ran last year. Yep, he was uh, quite successful in that car, and this is a little bit different style of car than the uh, Le Mans prototype, but it is a prototype nonetheless. And what Anthony means by a little bit different style, he means ridiculously different style. Yes, yes. That little bit was sarcastic for a whole lot different. Yeah, these are, like I said, they are prototype cars, but they really do handle like the uh, like the tin top cars that they are, um, or like a sports car, like mm -hmm. a uh, like your Cadillacs and your 4 GTs, than a, uh, a prototype car, or even a formula car for that matter. And Kelly thought he might be able to go around Carey. They're going to go side by side into the turn eight chicane. Carey looks like he's going to have the advantage up, and he'll take the spot back from uh, Mike Kelly. So Kelly thought he might have it. Brian able to continue defending and maintain fifth position. Quick shot of the uh, the nice trees and all of that that grow here at Barber Motorsports Park. And Russell Kyle still looking to see if he can get around Carlos Passos. Passos putting up a pretty good fight, uh, able to hold on to that third position. Meanwhile, Colin McLean has pulled a 3.2 second gap in front of these guys. So as these guys are battling it out, McLean is pulling away from them. Still not a lot in it, though. I mean, we're talking like, you know, anything basically under, you know, call it 10 seconds is easily caught up based on you know maybe a catching a round of traffic or two badly yeah especially at this track I don't know what it is for some reason watching uh, Mike in the all white uh, digital prototype it almost looks uh, at least from the back end anyway a little bit more in line with uh, this year's uh, Corvette prototypes that you see in the uh, Grand Am series uh, for those of you that follow that, this car being modeled on the Riley chassis, uh, I believe the 2008 Riley, uh, might be the 2009, but somewhere in that range there. So even the Rileys are a little different these days, but not a lot, but the Cadillacs definitely have a different look to them this year. It's not the Cadillacs or the Corvettes. 
I'd still say the rally is an ugly car. Yeah, no, it's just one thing about these, uh, we've, uh, I've mentioned it before, Anthony's mentioned it before, it's not a, like, it does look like a prototype, but it's something that, like, in the 70s, someone would have looked at and been like, you know what, you could make that look maybe a little bit more modern. Yeah. I think the, I think the Corvette this year in the Grand Am does a little bit better making it, uh, in terms of body styling, but, uh. It's still, you know, it doesn't look as good as uh, some of the other prototypes you see, like the uh, Le Mans, especially the uh, the uh, LMP1 cars, like the Audis, and uh, Toyota's actually looked pretty good this year, too, at the uh, 2012 Le Mans. Actually, ironically, the Toyota's looked a little bit closer to what these cars look like, uh, and the Audis did, but uh, yes, a lot of that is uh, regulations-driven, where this is a much more tightly controlled formula than mm-hmm. say the uh, the Le Mans, the prototypes, the LMP1s and the LMP2s. So the transition from real life racing to iRacing is iRacing was we have basically one chassis um, for each class of car where in real life, especially in the prototype classes, um, not this one in particular, but Le Mans, you'll have a lot of different variation, a lot of different ideas. And yep. those of you following this year in particular, a huge fan favorite, the Nissan, the Delta Wing, which is the most uh, radically designed race car in any class that I, I'm trying to think back, think back to like think the six wheel Tyrrell or the uh, the uh, Brabham, I believe it was, with the fan at the back, you know, things like that in Formula One. And the Nissan really is that Delta Wing was just an incredible, just shot in the dark to promote sort of a uh, new type of technology, a new philosophy in racing. Back with Anthony Muniz here, uh, coming back from what appears to be a very long way back after having come back from repairs from his earlier incident. Nope, there no repairs yet. I haven't met, been into the pits. Just been trying to tough it out on circuit. But we'll uh, jump over to uh, my teammate here, Brian Carey, still holding off Mike Kelly. This is still for fifth position. And then just a little bit further back is uh, John Cousin, who is still holding off Daniel Gralti for seventh. Looks like Gralti's got a good run on him here. Not a lot of room to go through, so hopefully Gralti's back. Oh, he's going to... That was close. close. Hey, he's, he's, already hit, he's already hit that part of the car anyway, so it's fine. It's already dented in enough. He's had a uh, couple runs on, oh, oh, and this is Carl Mumbauer who, hitting the uh, the Armco barrier there. I'm not sure which turn that is. Uh, is that's that, uh, after turn one, yeah, into, entering turn two. Turn two, okay. So and just uh, sticking it into the barrier. Yeah, getting turn one a little too fast, and that sent him off track. Um, there is some damage on the car. I'm not sure how severe it is. Looks like the uh, front is fairly heavily damaged. Yeah, uh, just he basically pumped it right into the guardrail pretty hard. So I mean, that's yeah. he, they're not going to be able to repair that if he gets back to the pits. I wouldn't think. And for those of you at home, because you don't get the uh, keys here, they actually that I racing will um, black flag the car to come in for repairs. And if the repairs are too severe, they won't let you continue. So um, we'll see if Carl's able to continue going. But I suspect that that's the end of his race right there. see slightly different lines driven there. And you guys have been pretty much nose to tail for a good... Oh, it's okay. They caught the uh, top bit of Carl Mumbauer's car as he tries to limp back to the pits. But uh, you guys have been pretty much nose to tail for a good 10, maybe 15 minutes now. Yeah, I'll be honest, one of the good things about the commentary here is... Um, Again, no shocker here. We're doing this tape delayed. This is not live, um, but I don't. Re- Otherwise, while ago, we'd be I, magicians. I do not remember uh, a lot of the details from this battle here, off the top of my head. As our a um, romance novel cover model is entering <laughs> the pits. Oh, 
Oh, and that was interesting right there. You could see Mike Kelly thought that Julio Palacio in the Cadillac was going to stay on the inside, which would block Brian Carey, although it looks like he might have done just that. It looked like he was going to push wide, which would push Mike Kelly wide, but just looking at the timing and scoring, Kelly was able to get by Brian Carey there in turn two. Yeah, come to think of it, I do remember that, so... But now we're back to the Dangralti John Kuzlin battle here. As uh, Loyola is coming out of the pits right now, I'm going to rejoin in, um, I would guess, 11th position. Oh, and that's uh, Timothy Stoll right there, who uh, looks like he went head first into the, uh, the Armco Barriers, but he's back out on circuit. He's um, not in the top 12, so he is quite a ways back, but still out trying to turn some laps and hopefully pick up a couple spots, maybe based on attrition of other uh, Daytona prototypes. Watching a uh, Jean Moret, a uh, seventh place car in the Cadillacs, uh, doing his thing, driving around the track. And back to some racing with uh, Dan Gralti uh, on the tail of uh, John Kuzlin. Now, this race here, uh, again, we're pulling up to the, uh, the 35 minute mark, so other classes probably, you know, pit at any time. We're the Daytona prototypes. In about two minutes' time, we're going to start seeing some pit stops. Is it just me, or is Dan's car being progressively more and more damaged in the front? <laughs> no, I, I think you're correct. I'm not sure if he keeps pounding away on the back of Kuzlin's car to try and get him to move, and he just won't. But, um, yeah, I think you're right. It looks like he's uh, accumulated a bit more front-end damage on that car. Yeah, because John's car looks pretty good, but uh, does, Carlton yeah. there is uh, looking a little worse for way, and uh, Timothy Stahl, who's a few laps down, is keeping up with them uh, pretty handily right now, so considering the amount of damage that he had sustained. That is one of the worst camera shots as they show the earth berm as they <laughs> go around the corner. Some of that uh, front end damage that Gralty has on his car might be holding him back behind John Kuzin. I mean, Kuzin does have that little bit of rear end damage that we saw him get when there was that bit of contact, but the front nose of the Daytona prototype is much more essential for its aerodynamics, although it's not it's not as essential as, say, like a, a Le Mans prototype that we ran last year. It is still essential to help create the downforce, and if he's lacking some of that front end downforce, that could be what is helping to uh, keep him behind John Guzlin. Well, as we say that, is this going to be a... What? Oh, that's not... Right? <laughs> what is it the pass? That's Russell Cow in for a pit stop, so one of our uh, top drivers is in. Right at the 35-minute mark, basically, he's coming out, so... Uh, Well-predicted Brian. And Mike Kelly, who had uh, just got past there, is now in the pits. So he had, had split strategies, and uh, I said there's a few uh, theories that you can do for uh, the digital prototype because your window is pretty large. 14-gallon um, tanks in a series. Um, the uh, server cars race 20, but we race 14-gallon tanks. And races use approximately, you know, 20 gallons, give or take a few. So. Because you can go up to 14, some drivers will tank up at the beginning, take a full 14, run as long as they can, then make a shorter stop, you know, the fuel in the tires, and go for a sprint at the end. And some drivers like Mark and Russell 
Mark, geez, Mike and Russell um, will go to uh, go split the difference, do uh, 10 gallons, 10 gallons, to hopefully have two quicker stints. Speaking personally as a digital prototype driver, I tend to prefer the... Oop, there's a uh, can racer car off the track, I'm sorry. But I tend to prefer the uh, fill it up, drive it out and have a shorter pit stop. Still relatively new to the car in the class. And, I mean, you can go through the permutations and calculate what the optimal strategy would be as far as, you know, tire wear, fuel consumption, the whole bit. But I find it easier just to tank up the car, go as long as you can, get a feel for the race, and then once you've got a feel for the car and run enough laps, attack it on light fuel. Now, how uh, long does it take in terms of gallons of fuel to change the tires on the Daytona prototype? I... I think it's, I want, for some reason I want to say a full tank, but I don't think that's quite right. Um, I just know that pretty much any time after halfway, the tires are going to take longer than the fuel anyway. So it's got, I think it's probably around ten, like 8 to 10 gallons, I think. Maybe a little bit more. One advantage, I think, to that strategy is if you're pitting later and you're going to be fast, a little bit faster later in the race because you have that little lighter fuel load, generally, in the later stages of the race, the, um, the traffic is going to be more spread out. There's not going to be um, you know, big, big packs of slower cars, especially in the Daytona prototype, that you're going to have to try and get past. So if you're going to be a faster... Anyways, because there's less traffic, that little bit of extra, um, or that little bit of less weight that you're carrying can theoretically, you know, quote unquote, theoretically, help you go a little bit faster on circuit and then translate that into hopefully positions gained on other drivers who maybe pitted a little bit earlier than you. It doesn't always work out that way, but, you know, in theory, that should help you out. Right, Dan Grolt trying to give John the uh, chrome horn again there. Uh not uh, getting around. Uh, everything's good. Like those two, two very, very skilled drivers. They know it's kind of what they're doing. I mean, John's. Or, I mean, Dan's got in the back of John a little bit, so uh, a little bit of a uh, you know damages we're talking about, but still a. Uh... Sorry, I was just going through uh, information on our colleague uh, Dan Gralti as we're on board with him again right now. Uh, Dan, one of the admins for ISRA, 39 years old, resident of Bismarck, North, North Dakota, originally from Virginia. Um, a lot of uh, sim racing, basically since the early 80s, he's been doing sim racing all the way from the uh, Apple II sim racing, Papyrus Indy 500, which is the uh, precursor to iRacing we're racing right now. His second... Uh, well, actually, he's been with this. This is the first season of the GTC, so he's got a few race wins, no championships, and uh, used to be a professional chef, so... Um, Oh, I didn't know Just that. Just kind one. of wondering where our catering is for <laughs> our commentary here. Apparently, he's cooked for the likes of Michael Eisner, a Disney CEO, Shania Twain, a Canadian hot country singer, Harrison Ford, uh, best known for a film called Star Wars, I believe, <laughs> as well as many NBA teams, apparently. So, uh, quite the uh, interesting thing. So. Yeah, I don't know why he's not cooking for us right now, but yeah. uh, I know he's in North Dakota, North Dakota <laughs> and we're not. But, Dan, if you're listening to this, which I'm sure you are, throw Send us a little food. with some food. Yeah. We do this for free, and we're hungry. Send us food, please. And Fabio able to uh, get around the corner there, even though his pecs are absolutely massive. <laughs> I don't know, for those, <laughs> I'll leave Fabio alone. I'm sure he's heard those jokes a number of times already, but uh, I'm sure uh, most of you out there have seen the uh, film Zoolander, and every time I see the name Fabio, I just uh, can't stop laughing with the, his uh, little uh, brief cameo at the beginning of that movie. <laughs>
Oh, race leader Carlos Passos is in the pits right now. Everyone else had, uh, up to that point, had to make a pit stop. Kevin had already made his pit stop, so... There's Carlos going by just there. And Clark very eager to get going. He had revved it up something good and just drove away with a whimper, unfortunately. <laughs> These guys covered by a uh, relatively short piece of string. Yeah, this is probably the farthest they've gotten away from each other so far. I mean, they've been pretty much nose to tail since about the 55 minute mark or so. Those remember, we said, yeah, remember we said previous races about fuel consumption, about how John, John Kuzland is the uh, the gold standard for getting fuel consumption, Dan Gralty uh, sticking with them, and uh, those guys. Actually, maybe they have pitted. I'm not quite sure, but I believe they have not. Which is my bad as a commentator, because I should be keeping track of the uh, little pit markers down there for the viewers <laughs> at home, but uh, I'm just going to let you guys flap in the wind like the rest of us here to see if they <laughs> haven't pitted yet. But uh, No, they haven't pitted yet. Yeah, it would make sense because now they have uh, Russell Cow, who is uh, running relatively close to the front there, uh, right behind them. And does anyone here in the booth know what the deal is with that big spider they have at the uh, end of the track there? I do oh, not know the story on that. Ooh, that was a sculpture. <laughs> I forgot the, uh, the name of the artist, but uh, yeah, it's a big metal spider. I would assume some connection with the track or the area, but maybe just a big thing there. I know outside my uh, my day job, I don't do this for a living, unfortunately. If someone would let me do this for a living, I would love that a lot. But anyways, uh, there is a metal sculpture of what appears to be an intestine. I don't <laughs> know exactly what the meaning of it is, but that's what it is. And we can see uh, Daniel Grelty leaving the pits now. So, John Kuzlin still the king for fuel consumption. Although Brian Carey's still out on circuit in second. Hasn't made Kevin his Swan. pits up yet. Yep, so we've got a few guys that are um, still out on circuit running quite well. I see two ISRA uh, sponsored drivers here, uh, Chuck Chambliss leading Dan Gralty. This will be interesting to see once John Kuzan makes his pit stop where he is going to come out of the pit set, if um, Gralty will be able to get in front of him or not. Oh no. Well, it looks like uh, Muniz is, uh, oh no, it's gone wrong. Very wrong. <laughs> As you hear the uh, mut muted whimpering in our commentary there, Anthony, oh, no. it was about to happen. Yes, yes. That was a very, very sticky situation. My things like that do happen at uh, Barber Motorsports. Uh, a lot of opportunities for guys to get into each other, unfortunately, and that was one of them. Yeah, I guess I'll just... Oh. <laughs> oh, that's another one. Yeah. All right, Luckily, I guess that so. opportunity was not taken. Yes, yes. Um, that one with, um, I believe that was Patrick Spence in the 4GT. Um, he stuck a little bit more to the left side of the circuit than I was expecting. I was expecting to just kind of hug the inside, and I thought that I had left enough room. But at one point, I know my spotter called three wide. I don't know if that, that was heard on the other driver's radios. But, oh, and Chambliss. <laughs> Luckily, contact was avoided there, and it looked like he kept it off the arm call, too, so he'll be able to keep going, but close call there for those two guys. But, yes, anyway, um, 
my co spotter called three wide at one point, and I'm guessing if it did for Patrick, that's why he kept it a little bit more left than I was expecting, and that's just, you know, that's the result of what happened right there. Now, there seems to be quite a number of drivers with that kind of uh, W-shaped rear wing. Ryan Huff is a... Uh, that is not the way that it is supposed to be doing. That is not maximum aerodynamic efficiency right there. I was about to say, I really do like the uh, scheme on those SRN cars, and unsurprisingly, SRN being the team of Marty Jeffries, who's uh, responsible, like I mentioned last race, uh, for a lot of these paints. So, yep, no, that is definitely damage on Muniz's car, and that is definitely Muniz going backwards. <laughs> um, not handling the way I used to, so uh, hopefully uh, head her into the pits and get some of that repaired, or maybe just tough it out, I'm not sure, but... Uh, no, that uh, that'll definitely be take. I'll definitely be taking that one to the pits. You won't be able to tough that one out. Yeah, uh, definitely not a situation for optimal lap times there. No. With a damaged car, Ryan Huff uh, is expertly uh, drifting it through some of those corners. There, a little bit of a four wheel drift, which is nice to see in these uh, series. Uh, well, this series here in iRacing, too. I mean, they have all types of cars as in real life, but these cars in particular are really good for uh, getting to see the cars move around a little bit. Um, recently had a lot of experience back in the uh, Williams, the Formula One car there, and uh, there is not a lot of sliding in that car, at least not visible anyway. And if there is, that's usually not a good sign. I should come to think of it or whatever, just, you know, feeling the car or whatever. There is definitely enough sliding that uh, it doesn't exist, but it's one of those things where uh, it's all the context in the car. Like, a, a big slide's a big slide in any car, where some cars are, cars are used to sliding, and uh, visually on TV you get to see that and think, oh, man, that's spectacular, but it's just, you know, the envelope of performance. And then sometimes with other cars, particularly formula cars, and sometimes the, uh, some of the more uh, higher-end prototype cars, like the Le Mans prototype, um, if you see any little bit of a slide, um, it's like, oh, that wasn't that much, but it was probably absolutely terrifying to anyone in the car, <laughs> so. So we're looking at um, Colin McLean. And he's chasing down Brian Carey, and this is a battle for second spot. And just looking at the time of scoring, Kevin Sava is still leading with Brian Carey second. So I'm going to guess that you guys haven't taken your pit stops yet, have you? I have a feeling that Kevin may have taken his. In fact, I'm almost certain Kevin's taken his. Again, interesting for commentary, but I don't believe my pace at this race was anything like... I wasn't setting the world on fire here, that's for sure. Timothy, unfortunately, on the other hand, was trying to set the world on fire using friction. <laughs> and um, <laughs> we'll see. Uh, he seems to be running pretty well, even though his car is smashed up pretty good, but uh, got some repairs done. He's got pretty good pace. Unfortunately, he's pretty far back, but. Open, oh, carry going a little bit wide there, and that allows McLean to make up his pass as they head down one of the back straights. Oh, whatever straight, it's a straight. Yeah, heading down towards uh, the seven seven A and yes. complex there. And actually, coming out of seven A, as you can see right there, coming out of that corner, that hairpin, it goes the left, sorry, right, left, right. Uh, the last right, which is basically a hairpin, it's cambered such that you can really dive the car into the corner, let it kind of settle into the banking, and then go around it. And that's Muniz again, unfortunately. In yes, the tires. That, that, was, uh, that was me deciding to, oh, the car, the car's okay, I'll just take the minimal repairs, and that was, that was the result of minimal repairs. And it's a pretty solid rage reverse there as he went right <laughs> back onto the car there, and uh, probably into the pits for some more substantial, uh, substantial work. Yes, yes.
And as you can see, damage on the uh, front of that uh, car there from uh, earlier contact with Plasio. Um, possibly another factor in the, uh, the pace being lower than it could be. Yeah, I think this is a uh, this is a very very challenging track for all drivers, and I'm not sure, Brian, if you've um, driven this car here before, but I know this is my really my first season of anything driving this Daytona prototype, and so adjusting to this car from last season, um, the uh, the HPD, which you know has a lot of downforce and all of that, and then going to this car, which is basically a glorified GT car. That is a big enough change in itself, and then coming to this track, that's um, another another big challenge to add on to something that you're already challenged by. Yeah, well, just in particular here, I have a lot of experience at this track um, in other classes of cars, particularly like things like Star Mazda and the uh, IndyCar and Formula One cars. Um, but like yourself, the Daytona prototype, I think before I did this series, I'd done maybe... Uh, an hour practice session at Daytona for one of the iRacing World Tour events. I never actually did the race, so that was my real only experience with the car beforehand. So, well, one of the beauties of ISRA is, um, and iRacing in general, is you can have an experience of many different types of race cars without having to worry about, uh, you know, well, I mean, obviously you have to relearn the tracks how the car performs, but you have a uh, the right environment to do so. So. This is a battle for third place right now. Matthew Voigt trying to go around the outside of uh, Kenny Coughlin. It's going to be a long way around there, but he might be able to get a bit of a momentum coming off the exit of that corner. And, uh, well, nope, appears he does not, so. And he'll get it going back down into the chicane. Oh, no, he did get past him. He did, yep. Got the uh, momentum going down the straight, and then into got the inside on turn seven, and then finished it off through the uh, turn eight chicane. Nicely done. And John Kuzlin now I'm has made oh well I was just about to say well he's made his pit stop now but he is going to just now be making his pit stop and so that is probably the longest I've ever seen um, a fuel load on a Daytona, Daytona prototype stretched out to we've only got 16 minutes left in the race yeah I just by the nature of the track I guess the fuel consumption wasn't quite what you'd think it would be and uh I mean, go a crazy long way to take a gas. And it's only fuel for John Kuzlin as he's going to rejoin the track after that pretty quick pit stop. Yeah, actually, just looking at it, I can't believe right now we're just coming up on 15 minutes left, so uh, kind of waiting for those pit stops there. Quite a variable uh, change of those pit stops, and... Uh, like variable timing anyways, anyway from 35 minutes to 15 minutes, so there's basically a 20 minute window. Ooh, it Mike Kelly spinning and into the sand trap, but obviously no damage there, he'll continue going. This is what we term in the business an aggressive spin. <laughs> and Dan getting a good run by himself I believe that was Muniz there um, on the inside of the track I could have been wrong but uh, looked like there was a slow car that seemed to have similar colors on the uh, inside of that uh, pretty quick turn Probably was me trying to get back to the pits. So actually, we got about 14 minutes left. Let's go quickly. I know you can see the uh, ticker up at the top of the screen there, but 
Now that pit stops seem to have settled down a little bit, we have Kevin Sawa leading the uh, Daytona Protoss from Colin McLean, about uh, 11 seconds behind. Carlos Pass is a further 7 seconds behind, and Mike Kelly spinning and crashing into someone. I don't know. Oh, that was Grulty. Oh, it's just... Uh, <laughs> we were about to say, let's queue up a replay, but we don't have one. <laughs> but uh, it looks like uh, looks like that's going to be the end of both their races. Yeah, Grotti yep. has some, some very severe damage on his car. Yeah, that is not going to be repairable. We might be able to get back to the pits, but I think that's his race done. Um, okay, well, now that that's sorted itself out, um, the... Uh, Kevin Savoy with about a 12 second lead right now over Colin McLean. Carlos Passos a further 5 seconds behind. Russell Cow in 4th. Brian Carey 5th. John Kuzel in 6th with Chuck Chambliss in 7th. Um, and just as I'm trying to get through here, everyone's deciding to spin and do interesting things. So that's Stephen Clark. The exit of the hairpin there. Um, Daytona Pro... Excuse me. In 4 GT. Chris Damron Jr. with a relatively modest 9 second lead over uh, Daniel Verns, which... Uh, Chris normally uh, very dominant. Actually, wait, is that correct or is he? Hold on. Oh no, no, no. It is that. It is that. Eight seconds. I thought maybe he's a lap yeah. down. Matthew Voigt, third. Kenny Colligan, Marty Jeffries, top five. Tim McLeish, uh, two laps behind, and then Patrick Spence is about ten laps back. So uh, Tim McLeish, last car running in that class, and then the uh, Cadillac GT2 class or GT3 class, I guess it would be. Uh, Ricardo Machuca, the leader by a sizable 51 seconds over Lauren Bateman. Um, his sparring partners in the last race, Mark Payne and James Cullen, uh, unfortunately not a factor at this point of the race. Uh, Jeremy Burr, Sean Cuthbertson, and Fabio Loyola in fifth place. And Ryan Huff, two laps down. Julio Palacio, two laps down. John Rizzuto, Gilles, Gilles Moret, uh, two laps down. And then Stephen Clark, about three laps down in tenth place. There's Chuck with the requisite barber uh, damage on the front going left and right sideways to that corner. That was a little scary for him. He's pushing really hard. He's about two seconds behind John Kuzlin, so six places there for the taking. And knowing the championship battle, both Chuck and John very tight in the championship battle for, uh, you know, in that battle for second place. So any position gained or lost there would be a very important. Yep. Oh, and Carey spinning in turn five. I think just about everyone has spun in turn five. I'm just noticing all these cars here. I haven't seen one that hasn't had some sort of damage or scrape or something on it. Yeah. Which is funny for a course with a lot of runoff. Oh, and Tim McLeish is into the wall very hard. I'm not sure what that was about. That looks similar to what happens when you get a screen freeze. So um, uh, I'm not sure if that's what the case was or if he had just done other damage and decided he wanted to park it aggressively. Um, but uh, basically what happens again, different kinds of technical failures. Sometimes you'll get internet disconnections, which will cause the car to disappear and it'll just go away. But sometimes when your computer will lock up, the connection's still there, but basically what it'll do is it'll freeze your last inputs, your steering angle, your gas, whatever it is, and uh, you'll just basically oh, go there's contact planet. between John Kuzlin and Chuck Chambliss, and that is pretty severe. Oh, he's put him into the wall, and Chuck is, I know what he's thinking right there. He's just put John out. He's definitely yeah. not intending to do that. He, he, he's going to keep going. Oh, there's John. John got away from that, so... That's why I have a feeling if uh, John had a um, race-ending damage that Chuck would have parked the car. Just It's one of those things where it's an online phenomenon. You definitely probably would not do that in real life. You'd finish the race and you'd deal with it yeah. afterwards. But uh, for the sport and sportsmanship in online racing is if you turf a guy blatantly, um, you let him by. Or if you pull him out of the race, sometimes you'll pull yourself out of the race too. So Obviously, it depends on the circumstance that led to it. It's Carlos Passos has a lazy spin in third place, but... He's far enough ahead of Russell Cow to keep Ooh. going, and 
in front of uh, Gilles Moret there, who luckily was able to slow down and not in both the races. Uh, Carlos really needs to get a good finish here because he's uh, retired from a lot of the races early in the season and is uncharacteristically sitting well back in the standings right now in Daytona Prototype. So now Chuck and John resuming the battle for that position there, but with uh, very much more ill-handling cars. Yeah, I think that's the uh, case for most of the cars that are still in the race. Close call there as General Seuss decided to track out coming out of turn three, very nearly causing contact between himself and Chuck Chambliss. So luckily, Chambliss was, um, saw that he was tracking out, either gave a little bit of break just to make sure that uh, he wouldn't run into the back, and then was able to get by him on the streets. So just looking through the field here, I'm just trying to see, aside from this battle here, if there's any other really strong, close battles, and... Uh, yeah, it doesn't really appear to no. be. I've been kind of keeping an eye on it, and this is really the only battle. Most of the, all the other ones are separated by a good close to 10 seconds, really. I mean, everyone's quite spread out at this point in the race. Well, despite the uh, damage that is now on Chuck Chambliss' car and the added damage onto the back of uh, John Kuzlin's car, uh, they both seem to be maintaining a fairly good pace, and it looks like Chambliss has been able to catch back up to uh, Cham uh, Chambliss, John Kuzlin, see if their uh, battle will continue. It looks like Chambliss gets split up there by Stephen Clark and the Can-Am Racing Cadillac, and so he'll have to uh, work and make up that about one and a half seconds or so. Yeah, unfortunately, that's a pretty awkward place for Steven to put that car there. Uh, looked like he was going to let uh, Chuck through before the corner. Didn't quite work out that way. Ended up in the middle of the corner and just tried to help it on the outside and hopefully not hit anything. And uh, we got out of it all right, but uh, it's one of those parts in this track here because you get a lot, you know, a few, not as much as Rogue Lana, but a few of those left, right, lefts. And they, uh, I was, uh, well, I guess left, right in that case, but uh, causes a little bit of bottlenecks sometimes. I guess since we don't really have uh, a whole lot of action to watch on the track at the moment, of course as soon as I say that there'll be someone spinning off or something similar, um, take, like to take a moment, like, there we go, Chuck just off, manages to save it though and gets back on to resume his um, attempt to chase down John Kuzlin. But just like to take a moment to thank our title sponsor, Z1 Simwheel, for uh, providing the LCD display for the winner of the clean driving uh, is it award, award, challenge, championship, one of those. It's whoever has the uh, the most races with zero incident points. And basically, in iRacing, you get an incident point if you make contact with a car, if you drive off track, and if you're able to complete an entire race without having one incident point, you get a point for this uh, challenge. So the driver that has the most points at the end of the season will win the um, Z1 Simwheel LCD display and you can visit 
uh, z1simwheel.com to check out that LCD display if you'd like to purchase it for your rig. Yeah, we saw it featured at the beginning of this program. They also make a um, selection of custom wheels. Most of them are like Formula One style or Pro, uh, Le Mans prototype style wheels with either multiple buttons on the wheel with an L, or you can have an LCD screen set into it. So there's many, many options. Go check them out at z1simwheel.com. I know. I mean, well, they are a very you know, important title sponsor of our series here. It's kind of like the ironic award because I'm looking at all these cars here, and I'm <laughs> I'm not sure if anyone's going to get through the race with a uh, with a clean driver point today. So uh, Chuck yeah. most definitely not. John, unfortunately, not. Uh, see many cars that come into camera view here. Uh, whoever that is in front of them. The only people that may be able to pick a point up for that is. Um, Chris Damron Jr. and Ricardo Machuca. We have hardly seen any of them so far this race, and they've maintained a very consistent lead over the rest of their class, so it is possible that they were able to um, stay out of any incidents. Although, if they, of course, if they go off track one time, that makes them ineligible for points for this race, so I um, guess we'll find out. Coffin went spinning right on the entrance to the main street uh, as we were watching. So we've got just under three minutes left in this race here, and unfortunately for uh, closing entertainment value, none of the race leaders are in danger at the moment. Kevin Servois with about a 15 second lead, Chris Dameron Jr. with about a 40 second lead, and then Ricardo Machuca with down to about a 27 second lead. So. Uh, this is the battle right here. This is the battle for sixth position, and uh, unless something drastic happens in any course, this will be the only battle decided uh, by the end of the race. Bit of a, a tire smoke thrown out there by Chuck as he got the back end kicked out a bit, but able to catch it very skillfully there. And uh, I'm not sure, uh, <laughs> looks like a, is that Colin, Mc yeah, Colin McLean's uh, yeah. coming up to lap those guys. But uh, I mean, Chuck, he's pushing hard, but I'm not sure how much of his heart is in it to actually uh, to stick one up the inside of John after what happened to turn one there a few laps ago when they actually got together. So it does make you a little bit gun shy to mm -hmm. go back and try to pass again. And uh, just in case, you know, considering you might only make the pass because of the damage suffered uh, from your previous contact, but it looks like their damage is relatively equivalent, so uh, you know, let's see a good fight over all the way to the end here. Oh, and we have the uh, white flag being shown, so um, leader Kevin Savoy has crossed the start-finish line for the last time, and these guys will go around for one more lap. Again, Savoie. So yeah, this will be the uh, last chance of uh, these guys here to uh, well, Chuck to make a move. This will be the most obvious passing place here, either on entry, under braking, or doing the undercut in the exit. So let's see what he tries to do. John takes kind of a defensive line to take the inside. Chuck running wide, see if he can get the undercut to come under, over across on him, and uh, it's not going to get done, I don't believe. But just the way the camera works here, even if it does get it, okay, no, he's not got it. But uh, you can see Colin McLean, too, realizing there's no catching Kevin, no point sticking your nose into this battle. He's dropped back. It's the phenomenon we mentioned in the last race. We have to be a uh, such an awareness of what's happening here. There's no benefit for Colin to get mixed up in this. He's not going to catch Kevin on pace unless something happens to Kevin anyway. So don't stick your nose in the battle while it's happening, and... Uh, Get your car to the end, because Colin's got a second place to uh, consolidate here. Oop, Chuck's a little closer than I thought he would be, but... Not many passing opportunities left 
Uh, as Kevin crosses the line, there's not really that many passing opportunities on the circuit for him to get around, though. And Damron Jr. takes the win in the GT, uh, the Ford GT class, and uh, Jill Moret has a big accident after the race, apparently. <laughs> and, uh, yep, Chambliss not able to get by Kuzlan for the uh, sixth spot there, so. I'm not sure where Ricardo, where Ricardo Machuca is on the track, uh, but uh, looked like he'd had a uh, pretty handy lead, uh, so it looks like he'll take the uh, GT, uh, the Cadillac uh, class there. Yep, and Ricardo, there he is, he's taking it, so uh, all the positions are kind of set out there. And uh, Marty Jeffrey's car looks quite undamaged, it's a uh, very rare sight out of all the cars that have finished. Spent a lot of time in that paint, doesn't want to scratch the paint. <laughs> Alright, well, once again, we're looking at the points with uh, one extra dropped that uh, should not be but Colin McLean leading handily here and I think that's uh, probably still true even with that week figured in. Brian Carey though we're retaking second from uh, Chuck Chambliss in 4GT. Chris Damron Jr. still dominating. James Mines, once again Mike Kelly has to be skipped because of the class change so James Mines leading well over Marty Jeffries in 4th and uh, Kevin Coughlin in 5th. Uh, Ricardo Machuca taking the top spot now because uh, Wyatt Foster missed uh, enough races. James Cullen, though, right behind him. And look at that, 20 points, 20 points, 20 points, 20 points, all the way down third through sixth. So uh, <laughs> I think that uh, the third spot is really uh, going to be the hotly contested spot this time. And also, too, we're, uh, I mean, while the races will be up to head as of what now, but you can go to israleague.com to check on the updated standings. Next week, we're going to be at uh, Mo Sport uh, Park, uh, Motorsports Park in a, uh, Bowmanville, Ontario, which is my home track. Looking forward to that race there. Followed by the two hours at Road America. Then Twin Wing Motegi, which will uh, be a new track for a lot of us, Mid-Ohio Sports Car Course, a popular track for all classes of cars, and then ending the season in Suzuka. So, uh, yeah, after the uh, Road Atlanta race where we had a crazy battle here, uh, unfortunately, uh, a little bit of an emotional letdown for this race, but a, uh, a good technical battle nonetheless. Your uh, thoughts, guys? Well, I'd say I know this was a, uh, we knew this was going to be a very challenging circuit coming into this. I think that uh, a lot of the uh, attrition rates kind of uh, is proof of that, but I think for the most part, guys were able to get nego negotiate traffic very well. We didn't see a lot of um, wrecks in with multiple classes involved. So overall, I think we saw some good racing, especially in the beginning. It kind of uh, quieted down towards the end. But overall, fun race to watch. Yeah, lots of damage taken there. But I was happy to see that uh, a lot of people were able to charge on despite all the damage they took. So um, even though there were some retirements, uh, it could have been a whole lot worse based on what we saw out there. Mm-hmm. All right, well, thank you, as always, to our sponsors, Z1 Seville and ISR League and the admins that make this racing possible. We will see you once again next week. <laughs>